<laughs> we'll reconvene the uh, meeting of the NIC Board of Trustees. Is there a quorum? Well, looks like all the trustees are here. Thank you. Would you join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic which will exist, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For public comment, I have only one. I have Judy Foss, and she wishes to speak. So go ahead, Judy. Good evening, Chairman Wald and trustees, and thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I worked in the Health Sciences Division in this college just shy of two years. I'm an RN and I retired last December. I have a concern and a suggestion I want to put before the board this evening. I'm disturbed by the strong arming that occurred at NIC. There was an appreciable push toward conversational conformity levied against staff and students some examples. One superior told me I was not allowed to talk about mRNA vaccines on the campus. Another longstanding faculty member abruptly shut down numerous one-on-one -on -one conversations between us because my expressed views did not follow a certain narrative. We had a professor body check a person with a sign. Her complaint is that people with such opinions would make it difficult for her to make her students wear a mask. Is this a mentality that you want to foster on this campus? I would hope not. Interestingly, after the board made mask wearing optional last fall, maybe one in 14 students thereafter were seen wearing a mask out in the hallway. What did they read? What kinds of research led them to quell their fear of the virus? They no doubt read some of the same things I had read in my research. I was told by one student, why elevate critical thinking than squash it with veiled threats when we students express it? Ex-Chairman Banducci stated that an institute of higher learning should be the venue of debate. The term university comes from the term unity in diversity. This college could seem some of the fractures in our greater community if it fostered nurtured and sponsored visible formal debate on all the hot topics that are creating hostility, including health policy. I would encourage you and NIC in this direction wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Judy. The next item is celebrating success. Jeremy. Good evening, Chair Wold, trustees, President Sabali, colleagues and guests. Um, I am not Jeremy Seda, if for those that know me. Uh, my name is Ken Wardinsky. I'm the Chief Information Officer at North Idaho College. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity tonight to let us show you what we've been working on uh, as far as the IT accessibility efforts that we've been doing at North Idaho College. Uh, Jeremy is unfortunately not able to join us tonight as he is up in Alaska right now, but he has in true Jeremy fashion. He's on Zoom with us right now and he has prepared a video presentation for you and then he'll be here for his comments at the end. We're doing the video presentation rather than try to do it through Zoom because we like IT that works. So with that, I will share Jeremy's presentation. Hopefully everything works. Chair Wold, trustees, President Sabali, and guests. My name is Jeremy Seta, and I'm honored to be able to be sharing some of the celebrated successes that we have had with IT accessibility in the last nine months. I attribute these successes to God's blessings in the work that I get to do and the people I get to work with. Let me go back to August 9th when we put on the first accessibility camp, Coeur d'Alene. We had a total of 130 participants 40 of which were in-person and 90 virtual. We provided about 25 different talks in two days that fell into one of three tracks of core accessibility, specialized and technical. While PDUs were offered, there were unfortunately no takers. And I really hope that we can see a change in this on our second offering of this annual event. 
For First Accessibility Conference, I was very impressed at how everything came together, especially since this was the first big in-person event following COVID. We had international guests and a few celebrities in the community, namely Joe Devon and Jenison Asuncion. They are the co-founders of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, or GAD. A11YTO founder and Guinness Book of World Records holder Chris Gowan was also in attendance. I'm proud to say that everyone involved made this event the most accessible and inclusive event that we've ever had on campus. And that was no easy feat and involved Ken Wardinsky, Steve Smith, Melissa Jessen, Ryan Scott, Bob Gibson, leading the charge with me, along with the co-executors of the event, Karina mason Morris of Idaho State University and Jeff Gardner of Irene AT. The next success that I'd like to mention is the American University of Beirut's ABLE Summit. ABLE stands for Accessibility for a Boulder Learning Experience. And that happened on March 31st through April 1st of this year. In the two-day accessibility summit, I presented four talks and a panel with the fellow ABLE advisory board members. God cleared many obstacles in less than two months I had to prepare for this conference. And AUB was very gracious in many ways from naming North Idaho College as a partner of the event to covering the flights and the hotel for my wife, Kristen, and me. Let me segue back to North Idaho and show everyone what has happened within the last five weeks. First, we had an amazing third annual Pave the Way to GAD event on April 20th. We were able to host this event in person with 20 amazing assistive technology exhibitors. This was the largest collaboration of departments we've had with this event. We borrowed expertise from e-learning, IT, DSS, facilities and maintenance, and some external institutions like ORCAM, Idaho Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and the Coeur d'Alene Public Library. I wish we had a little bit more participation, but otherwise I really couldn't be happier with how the event turned out. The 2022 NIC commencement was also a huge success. My colleague and friend Jackie Stallings commented that the accessibility work on commencement was well done and should be a model for other institutions. One of our blind grads was laughing out loud in the audience at the audio description that Andy Finney paired with the student slideshow. And Bob Gibson did an amazing job ensuring we had an ADA compliant version of the live stream, which was viewed by 234 people or roughly 28% of the views that we had on the YouTube live streams. And one last success happened last Thursday on Global Accessibility Awareness Day. What started out as a collaboration of students at NIC and the American University of Beirut ended up including others from Australia, Canada, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. This was kind of an amazing first time event where we just met via Zoom to talk about how we're going to be involved on GAD and it ended up branching out to discussions of how to be more involved throughout the year in the name of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So what's next? We have Accessibility Camp Coeur d'Alene happening on August 3rd and 4th, so be sure you save the date. It's an in-person event and it's going to be free to NIC students. We're working on offering PDUs again. We're going to have three tracks, the new passion track, as well as specialized and technical tracks. The after hours events that we offer for networking are absolutely amazing. And um, we're able to do that with our supporting partners helping out with those events. I'm thinking about how we can creatively come up with a faculty and staff challenge to help increase attendance and volunteering for the event. And now I get to officially announce some of our confirmed speakers. We have Dax Castro and Chad Chelius of Chax Training and Consulting, Jeff Gardner of IRIE AT, Chris Golan of A11YTO, Ryan Scott, who was with NIC but is now with the Washington State Services of the Blind. Jackie Stallings from Idaho Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Karina mason Roris of Idaho State University, Ken Wardinsky, Maha Zawayhead from the American University of Beirut, and many more. And on this last slide, I have a picture of me standing on the steps of the Temple of Bacchus in the Heliopolis in Baalbek, Lebanon. In case you don't have it, my contact information is jeremy.seta at nic.edu. 
And I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any comments or questions, especially if you want to get involved with Accessibility Camp Coeur d'Alene. Thank you very much. And we'll both stand for questions. <clears throat> Dr. Smalling. Ken or Jeremy, can you please explain to the board a little bit about the grant that we have that funds us? Um, actually, it's not a grant. Um, in, FY, in FY18, we received a line item request from the state of Idaho to fully fund Jeremy's position as well as operational um, expenses for accessibility, um, specifically for IT accessibility. Are there any other questions by board members? Todd. And what is the duration of that line item? Uh, indefinitely. Wow. And that oh, it was 300 and a little over 300, 383,000 a year in operational costs. So. Yeah. Hey, Greg. Chairman Will, thank you. Uh, is there a point of contact or email or website form where people can submit ideas for more accessibility ideas? Yep, Jeremy? Yeah, we actually have a uh, email set up specifically um, to kind of filter those questions and, and comments if people want to have, uh, say, for example, an accommodation for a certain event or whatever. And it's just accessibility at nic.edu. And that's set to go to both me and uh, certain folks in disability support services so that we both get it and can filter that ac accordingly. <clears throat> Shannon, could that be definitely noted in the minutes, the email address? Any other questions? Not a period. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Excellent program. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Walter. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yeah. Thank you. For constituent reports, school is out. So all we have today for uh, reports at the meeting uh, would be from faculty assembly. The others have submitted them in writing. So faculty assembly report. Chair sure, Wold, members of the board, uh, I'll introduce myself as Ben Tashida is how you say my last name. Uh, it's a hard one to say. Um, I uh, am a mathematics Mathematics, prof mathematics professor here. I've been teaching for 11 years now, um, and I am the newly elected uh, chair of the faculty assembly. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, and I want to take a moment to welcome our new members of the board to our NIC community on behalf of the fac faculty, wel uh, welcome. Uh, the faculty assembly had our last meeting in May. Uh, the faculty elected new leadership for the year. Uh, I am the new chair. Kathleen Miller Green is our new vice chair. Lisa Radke is the secretary, and John Gardunia is our new tre treasurer. Uh, the assembly followed up those elections uh, with a motion to place a letter in uh, past chair Molly Mashad's file in HR, uh, a letter of commendation for her outstanding service to the faculty and to the college during the uh, incredibly challenging last year. Uh, I want to think a, uh, take a moment to, again, personally thank Molly for her willingness to represent faculty across campus to this board and to the community this year uh, in what is uh, a noteworthy, noteworthy and ex, uh, exemplary way. Her composure and professionalism during many of the challenges uh, are outstanding. Uh, so uh, thank you to Molly if you're watching. Uh, if not, uh, I will forward that on to her. Uh, the assembly also elected new senators to serve on the college next year. Uh, we had a guest, Sean Noel, the athletic trend, uh, director, introduced himself to the faculty uh, and <clears throat> encouraged faculty to reach out if they had any concerns. Uh, and then finally, we had a motion uh, that is to both interim president Sabali and the board of trustees uh, at, <clears throat> at the regularly scheduled April board of trustees meeting constituent leaders were not allowed to present in person uh, their reports. Uh, based on that, the faculty of NIC formally request uh, the Board of Trustees and the College Pre President honor participatory governance by allowing faculty, staff, and student con constituent leaders to present in-person reports at every board meeting. Uh, on, uh, as a follow-up note, I would like to point out that it's uncommon in the summer for reports to be given. Uh, that concludes my report. 
Thank you very much, Ben. And you absolutely are invited to every board meeting. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Greg. In your resolution, you said we're not allowed to present. Were the constituent groups not invited? Sorry, we're not allowed to present in person. Uh, the uh, decision was made by the administration to uh, only accept reports uh, in written form, uh, and the constituent leaders were instructed that they would not be allowed to present in person. And are there any other questions? That policy does not stand now. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. John. I, I believe that at special meetings, constituents don't normally report. Is is that going to be the case from here on, or will be, they be allowed at special meetings as well? Our understanding is that special meetings is a special subject so that no, that that's not the case. Todd. All right, well, I'm gonna clarify something. I wasn't going to. That decision was made by the staff, not by the trustees. And it wasn't me that made that decision, but it was later brought to me that trustee Wood was gonna make a motion that allow you guys to speak. And that had been worked out. And I anticipated that motion at the beginning of the meeting. And she chose not to make that motion because I would have seconded that motion or at least we'd had a vote and I would have voted for it. So you guys would have had the opportunity to speak. That had been worked behind the scenes. So to continue on with that narrative, which is about the eighth time I've heard it, is incorrect. That had been resolved behind the scenes. I was expecting a motion from Trustee Wood and would have worked with that motion. Whoever had been there would have been able to speak. So please stop saying that you guys weren't gonna be allowed to speak. Yes, there was a time when you were asked to provide written. That's happened in the past. I've been on the board for nine and a half years. I've seen it before multiple times. Then it was decided because of the uproar and just for all sorts of reasons that you guys would be given that position. And, and again, Trustee Wood was supposed to bring that. Why she did not, you can ask her, but she chose not to. So maybe that was to continue the narrative that you weren't allowed to speak, but had she made the motion, everybody would have been invited to speak. So just so we get rid of that false narrative, that's what happened behind the scenes. It was negotiated, it was brought to me and I was prepared to support that. So just so we all know what, what did and didn't happen. Just think we need that for clarification. Sure, well, uh, <clears throat> yes. uh, with your indulgence, sir, uh, I was not faculty assembly, assembly chair at that time, so I'm not familiar with all of the communications that happened. I do have uh, copies of some of the emails uh, that were passed around, and those emails that I did see uh, made it pretty clear that faculty would not be speaking at those times. Um, I can't speak to all the communications that happened, uh, but uh, based on the communications that did uh, and all of the events, the faculty, uh, staff, and the Senate did not speak at those meetings, uh, and whether that was for feeling unwelcome or whether that was an actual official stop, I can't speak to that. And again, there might have been additional things after those emails. So, and again, you're right. You know, we weren't privy to all the information or all the communication. So that wasn't directed at you. And specifically, it was just to put it out there in general so everybody can understand there was more to that story. Chairman, well, Greg? I would just like to say this uh, past year and a half, this board has endured quite long board meetings, even beyond the three hours. And some of the trainings that I've had is the longer the board meetings, the less gets done. <laughs> And I just want to say that we've had some of the most efficient board meetings under this President Sabali's uh, leadership. So even though it may be a change from a standard operating procedure, um, I don't know, things, uh, good changes are in our midst. So I do, faculty and uh, constituent reports are welcomed <laughs> and they're definitely read when written or um, in present form and you're definitely heard. And um, it kind of just depends on how the agendas formulate and what's the status and best for the board and, and best for the college. So anyway, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Ben, we have three new members on this board and uh, this board now really, we're, we're trying not to spend a lot of time talking about the past and difficulties in the past. Uh, we're talking about today and tomorrow and in the future. And in the future, you will be allowed to be here and speak. Period. 
Sure. Well, I appreciate those comments and sentiments, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. President Zabali, President's report. Thank you, Chair Wold, trustees, <coughs> honored guests. It's been a, a busy month um, since the last time I reported. We did have a very successful commencement with 826 graduates. Over 325 students walked across the stage that day. We had dual credit with 104 students getting their AAs, and we also had 177 GED graduates this year. We also have recently announced that we received a $524,000 grant from the Idaho Workforce Development Training that will fund pre-apprenticeship programs in construction and apprenticeship in heavy equipment and construction programs. I also this week was fortunate enough to get a tour of the Meyer Health and Science Center and the remodel from Gary Stark. And I am pleased to inform all of you that it is on track and on pace to open in time for the fall semester. And we hope to announce a ribbon celebration soon. Um, ICRIP has been in the news quite a bit lately as I go through this bulleted list of information for you guys. We did appeal and we have an appeal date set. Lastly, I'm going to finish with some athletic updates. Our men's golf team won the NWAC championship for the fourth year in a row this week. Our women's golf team took third. And last week, NIC was hosting the NWAC softball tournament where our team went two and two. That concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions for President Sabali? Sure. Yes, Todd. Uh, it's not a question, just an addition, I believe also with our golf that our one of our, our freshmen, Mr. Swan, I believe it is, was the individual medalist. I think he took first place. So uh, kudos to him. I think we I think we had guys in first, fifth, and tenth or something like that, but we did the team did quite well. But again, I believe we had the individual medalist first place. Any other questions? Comments? Not appearing the consent agenda. Approval of minutes for April 27th, 2022 and May 13th, 2022. No, no need for motion or anything. If there are no objections, we'll accept them as circulated. We'll move on to new business. First item action is an action item to head start cost of living and quality improvement funds. Beth Ann Fuller. Chairman Wold, board members, thank you for allowing me to come with our uh, cost of living adjustment application as well as our quality improvement application for funding through the Administration for Children and Families Office of Head Start. Um, before you, I gave the notice of award in your board packet and that includes the funding types that were being offered. And that would be a $75,535 cost of living adjustment, which equates to a 2.28% increase in our wage scale. So that includes any um, existing or new or vacant positions. And it also uh, allows for the fringe increase that would occur when you give that 2.28%. And also with quality improvement, they went on a permanent, uh, a permanent scale of how many enrollment slots we have and offered us $14,572 to use by the criteria that's, that is in this notice of award. And with our policy council, and our staff input, we made the decision to apply that $14,572 to additional time for our mental health consultant and our child development mentor coaches to be able to train staff and families on trauma-informed practices. So we um, would love to have had a an even larger amount, but we're really excited that $90,107 would be permanent additional funding to our Head Start program. And I'm just here to 
answer any questions and hope that you are ready for to be able to approve this. Are there any questions? Not appearing, I accept a motion to approve the acceptance of the COLA, COLA and Quality Improvement Funds from the Office of Head Start. So mm -hmm. we're moved, are you a second? Second. We moved and second, is there any discussion? Not appearing, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. It passes. You have yours. And I'm going to sign it Thank right now. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Second item under new business tab two is the first reading of the Board of Trustees meeting schedule for 22-23. And we do need a motion to approve this. Motion. Oh. Are we gonna approve it or are we gonna do the first reading of it? Pardon? This was a first reading. The first reading, do we need to have two readings? We don't need to. No, we don't need to have them. It's, it's, it's been a practice on something, so. It was a big deal to attend to it. You don't have to, if you want to, if you guys want to actually. Yeah. Is everybody ready for one reading and go ahead? I see consensus. Okay, I would accept the motion then to go ahead and approve this. I mean, thank you. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I guess we could do first reading approvals now that Trustee Howard's no longer on the board. Well, we always could. <laughs> <laughs> it was, anyway, move on. Yeah. Let's move forward, Todd. Focus forward, Todd. I'm focusing. Dr. Spalli. I would just like to clarify that regular meetings are the fourth Wednesday of every month. Um, you'll see that in August and October, they're on Mondays because of a state board of ed meeting in August that it would conflict with. And in October, there's an ACCT national meeting that the trustees and the president may choose to attend. And in December, it's about avoiding the winter recess. So that's the differences on those three months. Thank you. No other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes carry it, Bible. Tab three is a discussion item. Adoption of foregone resolution. And Sarah, you're going to lead us through that, please. I am ready. Um, good evening, Chair Wold, trustees. Um, I am just here to kind of help explain and under, help you understand the process for foregone. Um, the legislature passed a House Bill um, 389 this last spring um, that required a taxing entities who do not take the full extent of the 3% increase in property taxes available to them in the past, that money would go into foregone automatically. After the passage of the house bill, it became a requirement that the governing board of, of the taxing districts pass a resolution to retain the foregone, otherwise it goes away. So this is um, something that that the board, if they if you choose as a board not to um, pass a resolution to do that, the funds will go away. It's about five hundred and eleven thousand dollars. The current balance of our foregone um, is about three point four million at this point in time. Um, Are there any questions for Sarah? Motion discussion. Are there any other questions regarding this? Well, I would just like to provide, remind the community clarity, um, just a bit of history. In 2009, uh, North Idaho College did recall the foregone taxes to a tune of 2.4 million. Correct. Um, and that was then recalled for the year 2009 and every year since. And um, then using that recalled taxes, we put that money into a, a set aside. Um, I believe it was, it's not restricted funds, but it's, it's designated, which means uh, 
the board <laughs> controls, and, and we designated those for property acquisitions. Uh, capital improvement. Capital, capital excuse improvement. Excuse me. Sorry Thank to you. interrupt. Thank you. And while we already have 3.4 million uh, in foregone taxes, uh, I think that reserving more and building that, we have plenty already there. And um, I don't think this agenda item needs to be on any future board meetings. Any other discussion? John. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman uh, my immediate concern with the foregone balance and, uh, and our, our finances in general is we're facing the possibility of not having insurance. <clears throat> and I would point out that there's another entity in this county that paid a multi-million dollar settlement in a federal case, and we could be facing that at some point in the future. Uh, I, I don't want to take the foregone balance, but I understand the need to reserve it. Any other discussion? Sure. Todd. Um, a question and then, a, and then a quick input. I believe we have to address this one way or the other. Do we not, Mark, we have to either definitively accept it or just definitively reject it. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, Trustee Banduzzi, I, I don't know that we have to affirmatively reject it. I think we, I think in order to reserve it, I think people need to understand this is not increasing taxes. All it does is it if we do if the board does a resolution to preserve the potential for adding this uh, this foregone uh, in, at some point in the future, should something come up. Uh, that's all it would do. It, it doesn't create a new tax uh, revenue. It doesn't tax the citizens. A resolution just says that the that the amount potential amount is being reserved into potential foregone taxes that could be taken at some point in the future if something happens. In order to preserve that, there has to be a, a board resolution. If you don't do a board resolution, then you don't you don't secure or reserve that. Okay, so the answer to the question is we have to affirmatively, if we're gonna reserve it, we have to affirmatively do so. If we do not, then it just goes away. All right, in our capital improvement fund right now, as I recall, we got about 11 million, we're at about 2.5 million and change every year to that. Uh, we've got 3.4 million already in foregone taxes that are reserved. That's uh, 14 and a half million dollars-ish. And we could have some things, but we have no large scale projects on the horizon at the moment. At least not self-funded like Parker or, or the remodel at, at Meyer. I gotta tell you, 14 million to me sounds like a pretty good piggy bank if we should have to dip into it. Uh, I don't see the need to reserve anymore to myself. Uh, again, and when, how and when do we go use that? If not given the oh, taxpayers a heart attack. And I, I guess the rebellion would be at the moment, we'd be here with pitchforks and torches. So I don't think we need to add any more to the 3.4 million, because even if we do go get it, we'd have to do it incrementally. We're not going to go grab it all at once. And every year we incrementally take that, we'd be able to add more foregone taxes back to it. So unless we were to deplete that all in one instance, we have the ability to add more to the foregone taxes as each year passes. So I, I think those become scarier numbers. And I don't think the taxpayers like the idea of having that potential tax liability held over their head. That's just my opinion. Any other? Greg? I would just like to thank you, Chairman Walt. Um, it took me a little while to wrap my head around what foregone taxes are. And, and if I could just summarize my understanding of them is, is it's kind of saying, we don't want to raise your taxes right now. We're going to wait till the election and then we're going to raise your taxes. So that's the simplest way to describe it. Um, so we have plenty in our balance sheets. We are doing fine financially. Our risk management with iCrimp is on appeal, and then we have other options at that. And um, if you see this on the agenda, it's my impression that this board would definitely um, plan to reserve your foregone taxes. So, and to me, that's just, if we're gonna raise taxes, we might as well do it now and be honest before the election. Mr. Chairman. Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, uh, Trustee McKenzie, I was right with you when this board of trustees took foregone to purchase the mill site. 
I pleaded with the president to not continue with the foregone, and the board chose to keep that going at $2.5 million. It was probably a, a good idea to do that because NIC has been able to purchase some property. But my concern is that $14 million may not be enough. And it's we're not taxing anyone. We're just saying we're reserving the opportunity if we need it to use it. And a, another side note to that is Idaho Code allows the board to levy for judgments. If we had a, a huge judgment and we didn't have the money in reserves, we could levy taxes to, to cover that. Is there a time frame here that we have to make this decision? Like September. Yes, sir. We we need to submit our paperwork to the county office in early September. So a decision needs to be made by the um, August board meeting. I think if you would bring a resolution to the next board meeting, we can act on it one way or the other. I will do so, sir. That's all right. Yeah, no, welcome. Yes. Since uh, trustee, my fellow trustee Howard, Ken Howard, he didn't have the votes um, before you three were elected to do what he wanted. He uh, made sure that the time frame was still there um, for afterwards. So that's all I have to say. Oh. Thank you, Sarah. Tab four, first reading, communicable disease policy. Alex Harris. Chairman Wall, trustees, President Savali, Barrister Lyons. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce myself. My name is Alex Harris. I am the interim Dean of Students here at North Idaho College. And I have been given the task of bringing forward a policy as passed by our Senate uh, regarding communicable diseases. Um, some of you may recall that last year, Idaho legislature passed Idaho code 33-2145, which basically required the board of trustees of each community college to have a policy on um, communicable diseases and giving the ultimate authority to the board to make decisions in regards to preventing the spread of communicable diseases. So in front of you, you have the policy, you do not have the procedure, uh, the Senate did not yet pass the procedure before they adjourned for the summer, uh, but it is um, timely for the uh, accreditation review that specifically asked that we have recommended that we have a policy in place to follow Idaho code. And so that's why I bring it forth to you today from the administration. Are there any questions for Alex? Yes, great. Chairman, well, thank you. Uh, this is first reading, and um, generally, if I might provide input, uh, just as I uh, read this, if in the first paragraph at the end, subject to the authority of the Board of Trustees, the college seeks to adhere to the guidance of public health officials to prevent and or minimize the transmission of communicable diseases. Um, if the Senate or, or writing crew could insert a, a sentence to, when possible, inform the Board of Trustees beforehand um, or give the Board of Trustees as much advance notice as possible. Because I know when the last uh, masking happened at the last semester, I was found out about it during a nick now and wasn't even informed beforehand. It was, uh, rest upon uh, without even communicating. So uh, I just learned from personal experience and would like to see it in policy. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Alex? Todd. Todd. Alex, and maybe this will be uh, discussed in the procedure. We did have an instance where we had to make some adjustments for a couple of weeks just this past semester. And so sometimes we have to have some flexibility and be a bit dynamic in our response. And I think um, at that time, Dr. Savali had to kind of act 
a little bit unilaterally, uh, keeping the board informed, of course, but he had to move, you guys had to pivot fairly quickly on this. Um, so I'm guessing we're gonna have some sort of language in the procedure. It's gonna say, you know, board has overarching authority, however, comma, the president can exercise good judgment, try to keep us as informed as possible if we need to do some things because the situation on the ground dictates it. Chairman Wong, Trustee Banducci. Yes. Um, I can say that that experience in uh, early February of this year uh, worked like clockwork, and uh, it was a great foundation in order to build this policy off of and the procedure. So those were the exact things discussed um, when the procedure was written and presented to Senate. Just ran out of time to do that um, with a few wording changes. But yes, the intent is, the intent is for the... The intent in here allows that to happen. And in the procedure, the intent is to make sure work, things work as smoothly as they did. As you said, we needed a timely decision. Um, we consulted uh, with Panhandle Health District and others and, and thought that uh, we would reduce the spread by closing down for a minimum of two weeks, inform the board, eventually approved it uh, in a timely manner and it worked great. So yes, that's the, that's the foundation for the, for the procedure. And I, my belief is that this policy allows for that. It seems like we did a fine, I'm sorry, both. It seems like you guys did a great job. So if everything we're doing incorporates and how we've been operating, I think don't fix it. It didn't seem to be broke. You guys were doing a good job, so. Thank you. Any other questions? This is a first reading or we could act on it. Okay. Dr. Will, I ask one more question. Alex. Uh, we're at summer. When do you think we'll be able to work on that pr that procedure? Do you have an anticipated timeline at all on that? Unless given instructions by uh, administration, I would still be following the uh, the normal route for policies and procedures. So I would have to wait until Senate convened in September to present them with a. F it would be a second reading since uh, what we already have it was a first reading. So I would guess that you would see that in September or October. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm not a Jimmy. Yes, great. I'm not opposed to passing this policy as written if uh, somebody wanted to coordinate a second. I would accept a motion. That it, are you moving? Are you making the motion? Yeah, I'll make the motion to pass this policy. Is there a second? Second. Is it moved and seconded? Is there any discussion? Not appearing? If I'm, if oh, I'm excuse making. me. Go ahead. Jimmy. Uh, when the procedure does get written, if this uh, policy could come before the board and, and we see that policy as well, I would be appreciative of that. Absolutely, that's the intent. Sorry, Chairman Wald, Christine McKenzie, it's, that's the intent is to bring the, the procedure um, back when it's possible to, to review and make sure it fits that, so. Alex, you're, you're great. Thank you. Any other discussion? Not appearing, all those in favor say goodbye by saying aye. All right. All right. All those opposed nay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tab five. Second reading action board orientation policy. This is you're going to speak to this. Dr. Sabali. Thank you, Chair Wold. This policy is about providing structured training for our new trustees, the ones that we have just gotten in, if we get new ones in November as well. With this orientation, we're seeking ways to ensure our board is getting the development they need and ensuring and affirming their commitment to NIC policies, procedures, and board ethics. Do I have a motion to accept this policy? I'll happily make that motion. Is there a second? Sure, I'll second. So we moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Not appearing. All those in favor say goodbye by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. If yes, if Greg. I just may have discussion. Uh, President Sabali, when when you go through this, I imagine for our new trustees, if if I just may go through the ropes as well. Either. 
Yes, that. that'd be great. Yeah, we will. Shannon and I will get out some emails, and we can do them in groups of twos, or we can do them in ones. So we'll, we'll work through that. Tab six: the discussion of board conduct policy. That is me too. And that's you also. That is me as well. <laughs> So last, last spring, summer, former trustees Howard and Barnes were looking at revising this policy. As this policy just applies to the board, it does not need to go through the Senate. In your board books, we highlighted the part that appears to be problematic as it can be perceived to conflict with policy 2.0105. This policy was mentioned, our, our board conduct policy in the action letter from the NWCCU. I believe the change to the policy last summer when when re-implemented and the board conduct policy was re-put in, was made to ensure that board members could still have private personal conversations that would not be perceived to be in conflict with this, with the conduct policy. Um, but it has caused, that, that passage has caused some discontent. So we're, we're bringing it back before the board to look at how they could revise or better clarify that section of the policy. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have discussion on the change, but I do have discussion on the policy. In the last document that we went through and in this, there's a part that talks about the, the confidentiality of, of uh, sensitive information. And at the end of the policy, it talks about what should be done. It says the board will be subject to the following potential actions. The trustee will be. Loss of board appointments to committees, loss of officer status, public censure or private censure. I think that's going to be the subject of a meeting at some time in the future. I'll put it, I, I will attempt to put it on an agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? If I just may. Yes, great. Chairman yeah, Walt, thank you. Uh, I was speaking with two former employees of North Idaho College. They retired about a year and a half ago. And they were describing the atmosphere on campus um, that basically they felt uh, freedom of speech was dead on campus, to be honest. And this policy, this board conduct policy, as written before this change, and also the one that it conflicts with um, 2.105, I believe, um, is they would, in sharing their experience on campus as NIC employees, uh, would like to see those two policies uh, definitely revamped to give them their First Amendment rights back to communicate with their board of trustees. And my experience this past two years is uh, def directly aligns with what they were communicating. Um, and the only reason why I'm hearing about it now is because they're retired. So I would offer to work with anyone on this board to drastically revamp this board conduct policy to actually address board conduct instead of stifle communication, um, as I believe that it was designed. Is there any other discussion Which on is, that issue? Um, I'm not sure which issue we're talking about, but I have a question. Yes, Todd. Um, I'm looking at the policy. I have something in yellow highlight. I guess the question is we're having a discussion, but what is there a proposal on the table or we've talked about, uh, I've heard correction or I've heard change. Um, so we're discussing it now, but there's no proposal at this time. Am I correct? I don't see any uh, different language that's being proposed or anything like that. I mean, uh, other than Greg has proposed that he'd be willing to be a subcommittee with someone else maybe to work on this. But right now, we don't have any alternative language that's proposed or anything else, correct? Mr. Chairman, yes, I may. Uh, no, I don't think there's any alternative language that's proposed on this. Uh, 
uh, Todd. Um, you know, this it isn't really a free speech issue. It's 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 an issue of of, of the communications between uh, faculty, staff, and board members, uh, and others. And and the, the, I think it's important to note that board members can always talk to the public. They can always talk to to, to people. Uh, within the college community, whether faculty, students, or whatever, and, and administrators, and that does happen. And I think, I think what, what, the, what is important here for this policy is because there's some confusion on this, uh, to clarify the language, there are certain communications that I think board members need to recognize as board trustees of the college that, that there are processes, procedures for students, faculty, staff, administrators to make communications that uh, 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 or, or to, to raise uh, issues regarding the college uh, uh, when they are what something that should be handled through a process that's been already created by the college or it's, maybe it's a chain of command issue what what really isn't is, is is to be avoided by trustees should be avoided by trustees is to make themselves not just available to talk to community members, but to make themselves a vehicle for people to go around the chain of command or to avoid the processes that have been set up to address certain types of complaints or other issues. It's it's not it's not to stop people from from telling trustees or trustees about how things are working at the college and in a sense that things are working well. But if they have complaints or they have uh, particular objections, and there is almost always a process within the college to deal with that. And what we want to avoid from a governance standpoint is to have these operational issues that should be handled through the administrative process be circumvented by either encouraging people to avoid those processes uh, or, 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 or allowing people to circumvent that process. We, we need to keep the integrity of the process to handle complaints because there are due process implications to that. There are things that board members probably shouldn't know about complaints because they may have to deal with them at a higher level and it, and it may create a, a situation of, of bias in the future that forecloses members of the board from actually participating in the resolution of it at some higher level. So. That's the hard trade-off here. Yes, yeah, uh, trustees talk to people in the community all the time, and they should. But it's certain types of communications and it, that 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 I think we have to be mindful of. So that that's what I think the the the, the, the tension is on on this board and with uh, on this policy with the communication issue. So this is a discussion item. So I would encourage everybody to think about how to do that in a way that is workable and does respect the lines of authority, the lines of communication, and the process that, that, that process, process C that are in place for these things to be handled uh, within, the, within the college and maybe not including board members. So, Chair Wold. Yes, hi. Sir, you know, Mark, once again, you helped make the case for something that I've been advocating for my entire time on this board as a person who acts as an IG and in the Air Force, I've often talked about needing an independent third party, whether it be an ombudsman's type position or an IG type position for just these sorts of things. And, and I think you just helped make the case for that again, that we would have somebody independent outside of the chain of command that people could go to as a resource. And then if there are appropriate issues, it could be addressed that way. Because unfortunately, same as in the corporate world or the military world, sometimes the very nature of the problem may facilitate you not wanting to go through your direct chain of command uh, and supervisor in this case or department chair or whatever so again i still think that it would behoove us to explore that possibility because again we've had plenty of issues at least while i've been on the board and uh i don't know why we've been so reluctant to ex explore that it works pretty good in the civilian world, the corporate world, and it certainly works very good in the military. And it does not undermine the chain of command. Chairman, well, I agree. 
Greg. In referring to an earlier comment by uh, Trustee Getty about a uh, toxic environment. And yeah, I think we're all here to fix that toxic environment. And, and one of those toxic environments actually uh, is one that I'm familiar with in the military. If you don't have the proper chain of command, it can be a very toxic environment. And one of the things I've seen in my duration of working for the military is uh, customer advocate and uh, the SAPR sexual assault prevention the response uh, within the Navy has worked wonders, has done a great, tremendous response, and it's directly aligned with uh, what Trustee Banducci was saying. And it basically keeps, maintains confidentiality of, of what, what he, uh, uh, Mr. Lyons, uh, just mentioned. And, um, and but also uh, provides the light, right level of responsibility to those who, who are going to those customer advocates for a reason. And um, so I think it would, to address our toxic environment, I think that would um, most certainly uh, need to be an agenda item and coupled into this policy. Mr. Chairman. Yes, John. <clears throat> May I suggest that this board empower the administration to look into it and come up with a person or a, a, a method to establish this? That's very reasonable. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I would, I would love that. So be it. The next item has to do with Robert's Rules of Order. And that's how big Robert's Rules of Order has gotten. So I think we need to discuss whether or not we're going to go to page 472 and decide on something. So uh, are you going to take us through this? I'm going to, me and Mark are going to work together on this. So with the makeup of the new board who may not have not participated in Robert's Rules of Order training, I'm asking that the board consider moving back to using Robert's as a guideline instead of a strict interpretation. Yeah, uh, thank you, President Sabali. Um, I can, let me comment too. Um, Years ago, we did have, and I say years ago, I mean 20 years ago, uh, the board did use Robert's Rules of Orders as, as strictly. That's the way the policy was written. We did have um, uh, issues uh, back then. I was counsel for the board 20 years ago. I'm, I'm almost uh, not sure how, uh, what, that, what that means. Um, but we, the board finally, decided to change it into a guideline because it would add some flexibility and it would at least minimize the disputes over whether the proper interpretation of Roberts was, was being used and how it was applied. I think it was laudable for the board to have, have gone back because there are some benefits to Roberts Rules of Order and, and that, that experiment started again. So I have no criticism of that. Personally, I'm not a, a supporter of a strict interpretation for a small board like this, and I think I made that clear earlier, but um, it, it was worth giving the try. And uh, ha having done that, it's been my personal observation that things uh, would be smoother and, and more flexible if we changed it back to the guideline rather than strict interpretation of Robert's Rules of Order. So. I mean, that, that's my opinion, that's my observation on it. And uh, so uh, if, if the board is in, in, inclined to do that, you can do it this meeting. I suppose you could defer it, uh, it's the board's call. So it, uh, I'm gonna leave it up to the board to how they this is something that relates to internal board governance. So it doesn't need to go through the Senate or uh, uh, any of the constituent groups, the board can make this change when the board is ready. Todd. Sure, well, just a couple of thoughts. It's, I was the chair that, uh, when that change was made, um, I think the dynamics of this board hopefully be a little bit different. So Robert's Rules of Order wouldn't be weaponized like it was previously. So it could be more effective than it, maybe it was. Uh, the challenge would be, and it became the challenge after um, former trustee Barnes left the board is that he was, other than Mr. Lyons, he was the most familiar and probably, Mark, please don't be offended, I think he was maybe more familiar than you with it. He was pretty pretty well, pretty astute on it, had trained and studied and, and, and used it. And, you know, um, so he was a real asset at, at, 
in that in that manner uh, with him leaving the board. Uh, Mr. Lyons assisted me uh, ably, but I think he and I uh, still had a few shortcomings, maybe, um, and we did our best. So uh, I'm not opposed to not continuing on with it, just if nothing else for lack of expertise, unless we were to get a parliamentarian that could assist us, that would have the, the true required expertise to do this properly. Um, if we were more user-friendly board and it wasn't weaponized, maybe it's something we could do if we had the proper knowledge base. So. The point there is either we probably have to get a parliamentarian to really do this right. Uh, and then I think the board could do it and use it effectively. If, if we really don't want to go to that, and if we would like to maybe keep it a little less formal and have it as a guide, then we can uh, go back to how it was. Um, I think either of those are viable options. Uh, there's not a huge downside or upside to either of their, you know, I mean, personal preference at some point. There would be the additional logistics and possible expense of a, par a parliamentarian if they, if they weren't on a volunteer basis. So it's a small issue. I don't think it'd be much, but a consideration. Right. Uh, I still would like to pursue my training that the Robert Jones of Order was uh, provided for us. I just want to clarify, even though it's a guideline, I think we all need to be familiarized with it. And I, I aim to pursue that I hope as a board expense that there's no objection from this board to uh, still gain, give me access to that training. And um, and also, uh, I want to say, I just want to say that Robert's Rules of War, I feel like if there was a choice presented in the past about uh, Chair Banducci and he was given a choice between A and B and he chose B, then the minority back then would complain about a abusing his authority and it, it, there was a no-win situation and somebody always had to complain. So um, with Robert's Reservoir, it at, at least uh, he could point to the bad guy of rules that he had to follow. So the meetings had, could be somewhat reasonable. And uh, I, th I think with this new board makeup that it may not necessarily be so drastically needed. Um, I think we seem to be more cordial and able to at least have a conversation amongst each other. Um, and I, I would like to still see it stay in effect, um, but... That's my thoughts. Yeah, I need a motion. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, two things. One, I, I think the college paid for the subscription for the training, so I think that's probably still valid. That would present. I believe it was an annual subscription, wasn't it? So, sorry, I think it was annual. Well, so uh, yeah, I think we're still on that training. And the, and the second thing is, I, if you're going to change it, uh, I think the, this board needs somebody to make the motion that the board adopt the use of Robert's Rules of Order as a guideline rather than strictly, and that board policy 2.01.03 be amended to reflect that Robert's Rules of Order are used as a guideline. That would be the motion. Would someone make that motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if Trustee McKenzie would agree to be the guide, I would make the motion. Be the guide. The Robert rule, Robert's Rules Guide. You suggested that you could uh, give us some some guidance along those lines as we go. To stay, have it stay in effect. No, the motion would be to uh, use it as a guideline. Can I get a second to that motion so we can discuss it? Uh, you have a second. I, I don't understand what's being asked of me, but I'm happy to volunteer to provide my Robert's Rules expertise. Knowledge is that what's being this chairman, trustees McKinsey, exactly. Yeah. As you're studying, as we get in the weeds, you may be able to help us get out of it. Just using it, Roberts, as a guideline. I'll do my best. Good. Any further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. I'll say nay. The motion carries four to one, and yet you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck. All those volunteering to take one step back. The next action item has to do with appointment of a board liaison to KTEC board. And I have a motion for that position. Uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> 
I would move that we appoint uh, uh, Trustee Rochette to the KTEC board. Second. You can second. second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Not appearing, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those in, opposed, nay. Motion carries 3 0. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we appoint you as our representative to the NIC Foundation Board. I second that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I would just request what's the thought process of the motion for the community? Mr. Chairman, Trustee McKenzie. Uh, Dr. Wold has been on the foundation board for maybe 15 years. He's been an advocate. He's been out there soliciting donations. <clears throat> I think the foundation feels comfortable with him because he's an old friend. And I think it's the right thing to do at this juncture in time. Also, I've been told that I have to resign from the foundation because of this this appointment to the to the board. So it would allow me to continue working with the foundation. Is there any further discussion? Not appearing, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. 3-1. Next action item is scheduling presidential candidate interviews. The selection committee has narrowed it down to five candidates. And we as a board have the obligation to move as quickly ahead with this so that we meet the accreditation standards that they asked us to meet. The community is asking us to make this decision as soon as possible. And we're having some trouble finding times for the board members to get together to do this in an expedient manner. Therefore, I need a motion to accept this. Let's see, where is that one now? I need a motion to authorize the board chair to work with the administration and the search consultant to set dates and times to schedule board interviews of the presidential search candidates. Can I have that motion? Motion. Is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, well, I don't have to sit at a desk on a regular basis. Um, I still have some employment issues that I need to address. And I do have some time out of town that was planned before I ever considered uh, this position, but I've committed to, to Zoom whenever possible. And um, I agree with you that time is of the essence at this point. We need to get this behind us and get a, a, a president, uh, uh, a permanent president in position. Any other discussion? Chair sure, Wold. Sure. Hi. Trustee Getty, I appreciate your flexibility and your willingness to work. I will share one thought. I think whatever we do, every time with all five, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be the same. That was part of the agreement when we interviewed trustees for zone five, that was been part of the agreement when we interviewed it went to semifinalists when we interviewed and went to finalists. And in fact, if a person was not able to hear all 11 of the semifinalists, they were not allowed to vote as to who the five finalists would be. So it would be inappropriate, in my opinion, to have anybody treated differently by any of the trustees. So in other words, if I did three in person in the hour and a half interview and, and, and two by Zoom, and then I was here for dinner with three of them when we bring them out in the evening and I'm only and I'm not here for two, that changes the dynamic and could change the decision making process. So whenever we decide, I think it's absolutely critical that we're consistent 
and that every trustee treats every candidate equally and has the equal experience with them. It's the same thing as asking the same questions of everybody. We had a set of questions that we went through in the presidential search process from the 59 or whatever we started with to the 11 to the five. We did the same thing when we recently did for trustees and that's been the norm in the past and, and Mark can speak to that. We've been very consistent, try to have the same experience with everybody on both sides of the equation, the person being interviewed and the people doing the interviewing. So I would caution us and, and highly encourage us not to mix and match between in-person and Zoom or who's here and who's not, because it's interesting if you even look at how the people were rated when we went to from the big group to get to the semifinalists, to get to the finalists, one guy that was down here suddenly is now up here, but that was because of the interview. And it's a, there's some real dynamics between what you see on paper and what you see in an interview and then what you see when you're sitting next to them, you know, having dinner and visiting and you meet their spouse. So uh, from the presidential search, from our role as trustees, having done this before, I think you cheat yourself and I think you cheat whoever is on the short end of this as an applicant if you don't have the full experience with them for the interview with the five trustees and that person. And then that evening in the more intimate setting when we're able to um, visit with them and get to know them even better. I think that's very important. So that, that's my input again from just having gone through the process. But I think we have to have a, a level of consistency there so everybody's tr treated uh, equally on equal footing. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes, Pete. I, I agree with Trustee Banducci that consistency is always good. I also know that at the last special meeting, we set up that we would do interviews the, the first part of June. I think that we need to get these candidates uh, in the interview before they take other jobs. And uh, as a, a trustee group, as a board, we need to make sure there's the time to meet and talk with these people to finish the process. Any further discussion? I would just say if, if I have to interview future presidents over Zoom, I think that's quite a disservice to them and quite a disservice to the people I work for. Um, or if any of you do that, that an opinion. Sure, Wolf. Yes, sure. Todd. Uh, just a quick question for you, sir. Uh, with the motion, uh, just a thumbnail, 30 second. I think it's a pretty obvious thing, but basically all you're asking for is the ability to try to work with, I'm guessing, Shannon and Karen Hubbard and and Angela and just guys kind of work it. And then you're going to try to put some dates back to all of us to try to see if we can coalesce around them or Absolutely. Uh, I have uh, individually spoken with all of you, and it doesn't appear that people are available all the month of June. And uh, that's just getting too late. These people need to have their interviews and know what's going to happen in terms of their possible employment. We may lose good candidates. So I think, yes, I would work with those individuals. And one way or another, we would get these interviews in in a much more rapid period of time than waiting until July or August, which would be too late to, for any any candidate. But why, why would it be too late? I don't understand. I mean, the accreditation, I mean, has us till early of next year. Excuse me, yes? I'm asking, why would it be too late to interview at the 1st of July or 2nd or 3rd of July? Because they were already, already taking jobs. That's too late. You know, the school year starts in August here. So people are looking elsewhere and they need to know sure if they're going like to be interviewed or possibly become president here this year. Look, I mean, it seems like we don't even need to interview them. I mean, what? pardon? Pardon? It seems like we don't even need to interview on, on candidates these days. So, I don't understand what you're saying. It seems like this whole presidential search has been planned out since January, to be honest, is what I'm saying. I'm sorry you feel that way. I think the, uh, the search has been done very well. And uh, 
it's been done in a very, very reasonable and honest way. So I'm, I'm very happy with the search procedure so far. You are. I mean, look at the results. I mean, like what I, people on the search committee have said to me, I mean, people were not selected to be in the finalists because the new makeup of the board of trustees won't choose them anyway. So I don't know how that was communicated to people, but. I'm not sure that I'm that we need to have secondhand comments here in terms of what's happening. Basically, what we have is we have five candidates now that we need to interview and we need to pick one to be president and see if they'll accept. Definitely. And I think we need to move quickly. So That's because I'm not able to get everybody together for the whole month of June. So I we don't need you and we don't need. Wait a minute now, Greg, please, if you want to speak, please ask to, to be able to speak. Now, would you like to speak? I would. Yes, go ahead. It seems to me that since we haven't, that there is a false sense of we have to do this in June versus July 1st or 2nd, that we're just putting the horse or the cart before the horse. Are there any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, John. Chairman, with Trustee McKenzie, yield to a question. Sure, ask your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Trustee McKenzie, how many people did you interview when you hired President Sabali? It was for an interim position, sir, not something spanning five years or, or longer, hopefully. So the answer is no? And a lot of the people on the candidates list were already um, familiar with on the list. So no. Thank you. I think that was a yes or no. I think you Is there any further it. discussion on the motion? Yes, Todd. But thank you for confirming that we don't need well, an interview for this Please, position. Like please Todd has the floor, Craig. We still have some Robert's rules going on here. You're alerting. Todd? You know, I, I don't know how well I'm going to articulately, I'm going to say this or elegantly. My wife has a way of telling me things. It's, it's not necessarily how you begin, it's how you end. It's, it's the end of the matter, you know, if you, if you do well or not. And sometimes we start and stumble and, and it, uh, you want to end well. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to ask you to consider the fact that it's not do or die if we don't complete this process in June and if we do get into the first week or two of July and to try to end the process well, because otherwise you're gonna be interviewing people and you're gonna be missing trustees. And I, I think that's just wrong. I think it's a mistake. I think the optics are terrible. And I think you open yourself up for criticism. And uh, well, I, I just think that would be a mistake. And I'm one of the guys that's jammed up in the second half of June. I've heard other people who are jammed up other parts of June, but for me, it's the second half. And part of it's my military duty, which you and I have talked about. And since I was co-chair of the search committee and I'm the longest serving trustee, I think that really would stink. I've just devoted several months to this whole presidential search process and given tens, tens of hours to this, including last week, almost 30 hours, just Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So, and I'm the only one of us that's been through a presidential search process and done the interview of the, of the finalists and done the hour and a half interview and done the dinner. So I mean, maybe that experience isn't worth anything to anybody, but I don't know, I've done it. I have some familiarity with it. So, and I'm part of the jam up for the schedule. So I guess I would encourage behoove you, you know, I'll ask you to, to just consider. I think that'd be a mistake, and I don't think we'd be ending the process well, or at least not as well as we could be. So that's my comment. Thank you. Any other discussion? Now, appearing, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries 3-0.
The next item has to do with scheduling facilities workshop, Dr. Sabala. Thank you, Chair Wald. We're, as an administration, um, Ms. Garcia and I are looking to do a facilities workshop with the board to discuss some projects that we have moving forward, including the DPW projects for Headland, where we were awarded $2.8 million and the aerospace hangar and what that may look like for about a half a million. We also have 7 million in deferred maintenance from the state this year and potentially talking about future housing items and other items on the facilities plan with the board at a workshop if there is interest from the board to schedule a date to do that. It's informational and you will set that up. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I think John. it would behoove the board yeah. to go through this. And I would suggest we ask the administration to set it up. Could you set a date early in July? <laughs> I will I will work with Shannon to find a date in early July to get on your guys' calendar. That'd be good. It's done. Upcoming agenda items, Dr. Zabali. Thank you. This is an item that the board agreed to have on every board agenda back in June of last year at the ACCT training so that all board members could add items to future board meetings and that a list would be generated and that the board chair and the president would work together to decide when those items could be on an agenda. So we are adding this item and working towards the NWCCU's recommendation that we follow some of those agreements that were in June. And we're just looking for some items for future board meetings of topics that would interest the board. Todd? No, I'm trying to look back, but I'm gonna give two seconds of context. We had those agreements, we had that from June. And the reason I think this needs to be readdressed or is being readdressed, it's not my call. Dr. Spally's doing this, it's his idea, but it makes sense to me because we had a couple of board members that rejected uh, what we had done in the ACCT training uh, with Ken and Mary. And so we have the things that were agreed to. And so for background, my Dr. Sabali is just going back to what we had done in the training back with ACCT. And so this is consistent with what was agreed to. So any other discussion? I think you're open to any board member yeah. that wants to bring any item at any time. Well, what we're asking is, is there any items that tonight? Yeah, that you would like to see in the June meeting? or in a future meeting, and then you and I will discuss when they would end up on the agenda. Great. I would like to see athletics uh, conference discussion, because if we're getting an incoming president, that, that's a hot topic, and the incoming presidents need to know just as much as what this board's options are before us. Because I've been told that that's a make or break for some presidents. Todd. Without giving anything away, that was a topic of some of the candidates. A couple of them, one in particular, started right out with talking about athletics. So it's definitely something. And I think the general feeling is for those sports that are desirous of it, uh, maybe reconsider our conference affiliation and even add a sport or two. There was some of that's been brought up and mentioned. So. Are there any other trustee recommendations, Mr. Chairman? Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, I've got a a little more nuts and bolts thing. And you're going to hear some of this about the spring enrollment report. But I went on to the uh, State Board of Education website. <clears throat> and in the last four years, we, we've got to throw out College of Eastern Idaho because it was a newbie. But College of Southern Idaho had a 4% gain. College of Western Idaho had a 12% gain. North Idaho College had a 15% loss. And I don't know if those numbers are accurate, but that's what's on the website. And I think we need to explore where our students that should be going to North Idaho College are going and find out why we can't get them back. Okay. Any other suggestions from board members tonight? Thank you. 
Oh, great. Um, how about, uh, well, I'll email you. Let me, let me put my thoughts together and I'll, I'll email you. Okay. And we'll move on to tab seven, spring enrollment report. Tammy, could you introduce yourself? Uh, we have some new board members here that- uh... Yes, I'll be happy to. Good evening, Chair Wold, trustees, Attorney Lyons, President Sabali, colleagues, guests. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. My name is Tammy Haft. I am the Dean of Enrollment Services here at NIC. I'm happy to report spring enrollment to you this evening, but before I begin, I would like to thank Nishay Noble, Chris Brewer, Lucy Hine, Dr. Kurtz from the Office of Planning and Effectiveness for the great work they did putting this report together. This report is based on March 15th, which is spring census date for higher education in Idaho. Our headcount this spring was 4,152, down 4.1% from last spring when our enrollment was 4,329. FTE is down 2.3% from last year's total of 2,520. To calculate FTE, we divide the total credits by 15. This spring, students were enrolled in 37,082 credits which yielded an FTE of 2,472. New versus continuing students. This graph allows you to see what percentage of our enrollment is made up of continuing versus new students. 63.1% continuing, 24.3% continuing dual credit, 5.9% new, and 6.6% .6 new dual credit. These numbers represent slight increases in continuing student populations, a nominal decrease in new dual credit, and a 1.4% decrease in new students. I would like to highlight retention percentages for continuing students have increased from 61.5% in 2018 to 63.1% this spring. And the percentage for continuing dual credit students has increased from 17.7% in 2018 to 24.3% this spring. These numbers indicate work being done to retain students is having a positive impact. A preliminary review also shows that CARES money distributed to students during COVID has positively impacted our retention. Enrollment by student type. We separate our enrollment by four student types. Academic transfer represents 2,713. These students are normally taking classes at NIC to transfer to a four-year institution. Dual credit students represents 1,566. These students are taking courses while still in high school, earning high school and college credit. The next type, career and technical students, comprises of 637. These students are taking classes to complete a certificate or degree to enter the workforce upon completion. These students are located on our main campus and many of them are at our Parker Technical Center. Non-degree students, 308. Often these students are enrolled at another institution and are taking classes here at NIC to transfer back to their institution. They're wanting to increase their skills for a, a job or taking classes for personal enrichment. Comparing spring 2021 to spring 2022, we have seen a 5.2% decrease in academic transfer 
Dual credit has remained relatively flat with a 0.8% decrease and CTE is down 9%, which is mainly the result of the closure of the aerospace program. Our non-degree enrollment remains flat. Overall, there was a 4.1% decrease among all student types. Yeah. Can we ask Chairman Walton? Yes. Tammy, do you mind if we ask questions along the way? That's fine. At our age up here, we may not remember mother than young Greg. Um, one of the things uh, I've understood, correct me if I'm mistaken, but with the CTE numbers, one of the things that we've had is a fairly high uh, number of folks getting jobs. Uh, There's some recruiting going on and, and uh, from of our people even before they're able to finish their program. So is that one of the things that's attributing a little bit to our drop in, in enrollment this spring? Some folks were getting hired out. I am aware that folks have been hired out. I don't know the percentage that would be the contribution to the decline, okay. but I am aware of that. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't going to peg you for a specific number. I just understood that was maybe something that was happening a little bit yes. impacting us to some level. Yes. I'm aware of that happening. So we're winning. They're getting jobs. That's great. Um, average credit types by students. We saw very minimal increases in average credits being taken by academic dual credit and career technical students from spring 21 to spring 22. With the exception of dual credit, which has seen an increase of five point, from 5.7 to 6.9 credits over five years, the other categories have remained relatively consistent with academic at 10 credits, career technical at 12, and non-degree taking four credits. I would like to note too, with career technical, 12 is not uncommon because those students are in cohorted programs and they are built on full-time models. Course enrollment by division. This slide was included in your packet, but as I was reviewing it, it came to light that it is not accurate. And the reason for that is it is, um, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. Course enrollment by division. Um, this, this slide I am talking about. This slide provides an overview of seat counts, which means that students are counted each time they fill a seat. The five-year trend line on the far right provides a nice visual for each division. The most significant change in enrollment from last spring was in aerospace, which is down 100% due to the program ending. Communication fine arts, health professions, and trade and industry divisions experienced increases. Also important to note is nursing and health profession trend lines have continued to increase since 2018. Enrollment by program. This is the slide that I will not be discussing this evening. As I was reviewing the information, it came to light that the numbers are based on an individual program, and we give students the opportunity to be enrolled in more than one program. So if this is something that you are interested in learning more about, we'll be happy to work on the report and bring it back to you uh, when we do enrollment reports next year. Our full-time versus part-time enrollment, both full-time and part-time are down from last spring. Part-time decreased 5.4% to 2,691, and full-time decreased 1.6% to 1,461. The bar chart provides a nice visual of full-time versus part-time. We continue to remain fairly consistent with approximately 35% of our students being enrolled full-time and 65% being enrolled part-time. Full-time students are those that are enrolled in 12 or more credits and part-time students are enrolled in 11 or less. We saw a 2.1% increase in the 19 or younger age range, which also correlates with the slight increase in dual credit students. We experienced the steepest declines in students ages 20 to 39 years old, contributing factors being COVID and the availability of jobs. 
Interestingly, I found a recent publication by the Student Clearinghouse dated October 21st that's based on the information that is reported by colleges and universities across the US of which NIC is one of those colleges reporting to them. And these numbers mirror their study that they released in 2021. Our top 10 feeder high schools, the pie chart on the right provides a nice visual and represents the percentage enrollment for the top 10 feeder high schools. We saw increases from Lakeland, Sandpoint, and Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy. GED and homeschool while down also continued to be top feeders. I think it's also important to note that sometimes there might be confusion over the top feeder high schools. That's for all students enrolled at NIC, regardless of their age. It's not those students that are coming to us immediately from high school. Greg, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. The page prior, if I may. Yeah. Oh. Did you say that our numbers match the macro numbers that you found in that study? Our, our numbers do not match them. Our numbers are matching the trends that they are seeing as well with the declines in the age bands. Thank you. Yes. Here are the top 10 feeder high schools for dual credit. Sandpoint significant increase of 288.9% is a result of them offering medical terminology this spring. Orfino's 53.6% increase is a result of computer applications and office technology classes being offered in the high school. North Idaho STEM Charters Academy 35% increase is due to students taking academic classes in preparation for CTE programs. Our largest decline of 11.1% at Post Falls is a result of U of I providing more offerings at the Post Falls High School while we continue to offer computer applications and office technology classes. This modality chart provides an overview of the delivery of the modes of classes, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and online. While we have returned to pre-COVID num while we haven't returned to pre-COVID numbers, there was a significant increase in face-to-face -face counts with a decrease in hybrid and online. I will say, based upon a lot of conversations with students and feedback from students, they really have shared with us that they prefer face-to-face -face classes. 57.1% of the sections were face-to-face, 16.7% hybrid, and 26.3% online. As we move into fall and spring semester, I want to highlight that we are continuing to work hard to increase our enrollment. Our FYA initiative that started last year as a pilot is continuing and growing. We will be offering that not only in the fall semester, but also spring. Additionally, we are providing alternate starts with our scheduling so that students can start with us when semester start and take 16 week classes. They'll also have the ability to enroll at the start of the semester in eight or 12 week classes, and then we'll follow up with late start eight and 12 week classes. So we hope that by providing those additional offerings that will allow students who may not be able to begin with us in August or January to start with us later. Additionally, there's a lot of work being done on evening classes so that we can expand our evening offerings and provide classes for those that are working and need to come to NIC during the evenings. And we continue to increase our communication to students and prospective students in hopes that we can guide them through enrollment processes and have them in our classes at the beginning of the semester. That concludes this spring 2020 enrollment report. I would be happy to accept questions. Are there any questions, board members? Looks very complete. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item is presidential search update.
Dr. Silvis and I were playing rock, paper, scissors to see who was going to come up and give the update. Um, as um, Chairman and Trustees, um, as Trustee Banducci mentioned, we had um, interviews last week. Um, they were conducted over Zoom with the 11 finalists that that semifinalists, sorry, but the 11 semifinalists that the committee had identified. Um, they were one hour interviews. Um, they they went very well. They were exhausting. I will say they were exhausting. Um, but, <laughs> but the interviews went well. The committee was able to recommend five finalists to the board. And as everyone has heard this evening, there there is um, a plan to work on securing dates to bring those the to bring finalists to campus. Um, not sure what else to update that hasn't already been mentioned, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if that's appropriate. Are there any questions? Uh, Chair, not a question, but yes, more about a thank you to the search committee. Uh, as was said, it was about 30 hours of interviews over three days. So uh, just want to say thank you for the committee's time on that. I guess I would add to um, kind of to echo what Trustee Banducci had said earlier. It um, was quite an interesting process to observe um, the dynamics of a committee that was willing to listen to each other. And it was very clear along the path that that people were willing to open their minds to the possibilities that someone may be different in person than they were on paper. And that was, um, I, I think I would give huge kudos to Angela Provart of the Poly Group for conducting such a fabulous process. I believe she, she did a stellar job. Any other questions or comments for Sarah? I too would like to commend the committee. You've done a fantastic job. Now, hopefully we can do a similar fantastic job. Our, our work is cut out for us. Thank you. Accreditation updates, Dr. Sabali. Thank you. Um, this is gonna be a new feature to board meetings um, after Chair Wold and I met. And um, it's great that we're doing this as we head into our mid-cycle review next April. Um, next month, I'm going to invite Dr. Kurtz's team to present on their work with mission fulfillment measures. Their work has helped the institution move forward with evaluating progress towards our strategic plan. So that's something to look forward to next month. But um, we have five recommendations that we are working on meeting and improving on it because accreditation is about quality improvement. And three of them came from the letter of action that we received on April 1st. The first one asked us to get to five board members. And as I can count tonight, we are at five. So we have successfully completed that one. The second one asked for the board of trustees to review, affirm, and adhere to institutional and board policies, particularly those pertaining to appropriate roles and responsibilities, expectations, professional conduct, and ethics and grievance procedures. We as a board or you guys as a board are working through that. You have a consent agenda that you've added recently. You've been passing policies. We passed policies again tonight. And um, that, is, that is one example of evidence that we are generating. We have also had some training. Trustee McKenzie attended the ACCT GLI training in March. And the board orientation policy that you approved tonight is another example of training that board members are going to go through and reaffirm their commitment to the policies and procedures. Uh, we're working towards a resolution on the board conduct policy. We had some discussion on that tonight and there has been public comment at every regular board meeting since November. The third thing from the action letter was hiring a president and that was recommended and then hiring the vice presidents after that president. Finalists have been selected for the president. So we are making progress in that area as well. The last two recommendations came from the seven year visit. And the first one was asked that we establish meaningful indicators, metrics to align with and a measure institutional goals and objectives in its evaluation, planning and resource allocation processes to support institutional effectiveness and student achievement. And Dr. Kurtz and his team will speak more to that next month, but things that we have done and are working towards as we've updated the relationship among NIC strategic plan and the four master plans. We've redefined mission 
fulfillment, taking advantage of the new NWCCU standards, allowing colleges to use measures for improving institutional effectiveness instead of core themes. There are 20 measures proposed along with a definition of success. The measures are now aligned with the three goals from NIC strategic plan. They will also next month show you the dashboard that they created. A mission fulfillment dashboard has been created using Power B1 visualizations that highlights the measures along with the respective scores and benchmarks. The planning strategy and effectiveness team anticipates that the completion of this dashboard by August, 2022. The second recommendation that came from the second from the seven year visit was to engage in an effective system of learning outcomes, assessment processes across all academic and learning support programs and use the results of those assessments to evaluate the quality of learning and to inform academic and learning support plan. SLOA is the acronym for Student Learning Outcomes and Assessment. That committee has been partnering with the planning and effectiveness team, the e-learning team and information technology to develop a new infrastructure for faculty to submit student achievements, data, and display student achievement results for general education learning outcomes. They've also created a system of entering student learning outcomes for GEM courses. And they have also transferred the data to a data visualization platform for faculty to analyze and make improvements of courses and programs based upon the disaggregation of data. They've support and provided to GEM leaders for work over the summer and fall for preparation of GEM retreats. And they've also, and the institution has also started working on the development of a similar infrastructure for faculty to evaluate respective programs, learning outcomes. So we are making great work on the five recommendations for the mid-cycle visit in April. Um, I believe those dates are set April 19th through the 21st, just so the board has some awareness on that. Is there any questions? Any questions or discussion from board members? Thank you. And this will be on the agenda every month. This is primary in terms of what our concern. Yes, next next month I will invite Dr. Kurtz's team to do a presentation on one of the recommendations for you guys. Thank you. Are there any remarks for the good of the org? Mr. Chairman. Yes, John. Mr. Chairman, I had the opportunity on graduation today or day to meet with a, a proud grandfather, Tom Luna, who was a former uh, state superintendent of public instructions, granddaughter graduated from NIC with her associate's degree before she got her college diploma. I mean, her high school diploma. And I think that's just great. Congratulations to the college. Anything else? Not appearing, we are adjourned.